It's a real privilege to be here with you at uh, the 6.30. And we're going to be concluding tonight our mini-series from 1 John. And so if you've been here the last few weeks, you'll know we've been tracking through that. And um, we are closing the series with uh, 1 John. And we're going to be reading tonight from 1 John 4, starting at verse 16. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete amongst us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Well, every morning I receive a text message from God. And um, this is a really good start to my day. When I say I receive a text message from God, I subscribe to a text messaging service and it sends me an abbreviated Bible verse every day and I thought it would be amusing at the time to save the number as God. And um, I found that a benefit. I mean, it's, it's a slightly odd thing to do, but I found it a benefit because largely when I'm scrolling through text messages that I'm not particularly fussed by, I don't generally scroll over God. I kind of wonder, you know, what might God be saying to me today? So I generally read the verse at the start of the day and, you know, that's, that's interesting and it's good. But there's a couple of things you should know about kind of automated text message services like that. The first is that if it's a Bible verse, when they tend to abbreviate the verse for impact. So they kind of, they make the verse slightly shorter because they want it to be pithy and, you know, it's going to change your life. But if it's like a super long, complicated verse, you're probably going to get lost. So they just abbreviate it slightly to make it a bit more punchy. But they also, the, the other thing about the text messaging service, I've been subscribing to this one for oh, about seven or eight years, is that after a couple of years, you see the same text messages kind of coming around the block again. Now, that's actually quite a good thing because it'd be quite weird, wouldn't it, if they just kind of ran out of content after a couple of years and start saying, oh, I think we might have done this one before, you know, maybe we should like write some new ones. I'm quite glad that, you know, the same Bible verses actually come around the block. There's not like someone else is making up verses to send me. The thing about the whole thing, you know, I digress. The thing about the whole deal is with the text messaging thing, though, is actually you can end up with kind of a, what I'd call a nemesis verse. You know, when your phone pings, rather than kind of feeling pumped about what God might be saying, you kind of got this strange apprehension within you that God might be on your case and he might be sending you your abbreviated nemesis verse right now. And you know, my abbreviated nemesis verse is actually 1 John 4, verse 18, uh, which, you know, I think we've got an illustration of this because I I actually took a screenshot of my phone. Uh, There's God. um, And, uh, you know, you can see, actually, I couldn't, because of the way my phone eats verses, I had to put in my own one here. So uh, you can see what it looks like. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Now, just for impact, this could look like this, but also like it's been turned into about 900,000 memes. And you might have received one on your Facebook wall. They all say abbreviations of perfect love casts out fear. You know, there's some that are more, more like in line with the scripture, but there's some that are just kind of general impact, like perfect love casts out all fears. I see that one quite a lot. Perfect love casts out all fears. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm a, kind of a little bit afraid every day about a whole load of different sorts of things. And um, my day is made just that little bit more scary when I read the one who fears is not made perfect in love because I kind of feel that's about me. So rather than being an encouraging Bible verse from God, it, it feels more like a judgment on my life. It's like, oh, you're fearful again. Oh, there we are. There's another example about how perfect love isn't evident in your life at all, Will. It, clearly you're devoid of perfect love because clearly you're fearing again. Uh, I, I feel like I should have a t-shirt printed, not made perfect in love. You know, you get those slogan t-shirts. Or a Facebook profile, sorry guys, I'm not made perfect in love today. Um, you know, there's something about it, it just feels like, oh, it's a, it's a judgment on my spirituality. What am I supposed to do? As someone who has a, an anxiety problem, I've had this abbreviated verse preached over me. I've had it spoken over me. I've had it inadvertently slipped into conversation by well-meaning Christians who are hoping that I'll be subtly rebuked by it and, and actually won't notice it at the same time. Um, you know, any of my worst moments has left me wondering if there's any hope for me at all experiencing the perfect love of God. You know, it's just another day of feeling fearful and being reminded that, oh yeah, you know, there's no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, and that's kind of not me. So there we are. Uh, I guess I haven't won that one. Life seems to be punctuated by fears, doesn't it? Uh, If you let them, they tend to a big mass of grey. They kind of swirl around you like a scotch mist. 
And maybe today you find yourself feeling fearful, overwhelmed maybe by stuff that's going on at work or some situation in relationship or something about your family or on summer holidays and you're, you're kind of dreading going back. And maybe you're just awash with stress and worry, you're not really sure why. The thing is, I've realized it's a trick, like where's Wally? You know, that all, all worries are the same. Actually, some wear stripy red and red white shirts and are kind of hiding. But if you put Wally amongst a big crowd, you kind of can't see him. It's the same with worries. If you kind of let them all merge into one great mass, you, you kind of can't see them. But we've got big fears and we've got little fears. Uh, things that get us really worried and other things that are just a minor irritation. I would say a minor irritation is my propensity to wonder whether I've offended someone in the last meeting I was in. I kind of think, oh, did I say the wrong thing? Oh, I know, I think it's okay. That's a minor irritation. But a really big worry is that I'm outside the perfect love of God. I've got to be honest. Like a really serious worry of me is like, yes, sorry, you're not in. That's a major deal to me. And so you can see why I was getting pretty concerned about God texting me again, 1 John 4.18, and why I was hugely relieved when I preached on 1 John 4.18 for the first time, and I realised I was worrying for nothing. But hey, there's something about worry in there, isn't there? Isn't it always the case that, you know, we're largely worrying about nothing? You see, the problem with abbreviations is that they've invariably chosen to actually leave something out. You just kind of hope that they wouldn't leave out the important bit. And here with 1 John 4.18, they kind of have, hey-ho, 900,000 memes just left out the detail that would save me a whole lot of anguish. Because the fact is that 1 John 4.18 is not saying that perfect love casts out all fears. Far from it. That's far too general in the scheme of worrying. It's a very specific thing. In fact, 1 John 4.18 says that perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. And a specific Greek word was used here called kolosin. You can see it here interjected in the text. Kolosin, the word for punishment. It's also translated torment. And it's a word that Matthew uses specifically in Matthew 25.46 when he references eternal judgment. He says, then they will go away to eternal colosin punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. You see, John never wrote to the church to tell them that when they became a Christian, they would never fear again. He never wrote to them to say that now they were Christian, they would have no fears. He never wrote to tell them that the perfect love of God was gonna drive all of the fears away from their consciousness. He wrote to them to tell them that they no longer needed to fear the punishment of God. And that was going to have a revolutionary impact on their confidence. You see, whilst Paul was writing to the New Testament church to give them lots of information about their behaviour, John was writing to the New Testament church to try and change their attitudes towards that information. It's like education. If you've got a child who's incredibly intelligent but lacks confidence, they don't perform particularly well. If you've got a child who's incredibly confident but lacks intelligence, they don't perform particularly well. But what tends to work very well is when you get a child who gets the information and is confident with the information that they're giving. And so whilst John is telling the church lots of information, sorry, Paul's telling the church lots of information, John is telling the church, be confident. Be confident about this core issue. So whilst I was super worried that 1 John 4.18 was leaving me out in the spiritual cold, I've come to realise that this verse was an affirmation and not a judgement. Actually, John was saying to me, look, the perfect love of God made known to you in the person of Jesus Christ has pushed away this fear that you carried of death and judgment. And when you drill it down, so many fears are actually rooted in this fear of death and fear of judgment. You no longer need to fear judgment because God has resolved this issue for you in the person of Jesus Christ. In Proverbs 14, 26, it says, In the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence, and his children will have a refuge. So there's a benefit in being fearful of God, because it provokes you to be concerned about judgment. But then the resolution is that you find refuge because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. So, you know, I'm not fast anymore about receiving a message from God, with my nemesis verse included. Is it business as usual for worry heads like me, just with one big ticket item ticked off the list? Is it like, just carry on worrying about everything, but you know, you just don't need to worry about that thing anymore. You can all feel relaxed now. There's no condemnation for any worriers here. 
At our last vicarage, me and my wife, Louis, um, lived next to a, a, an elderly gentleman who was unable to garden. Uh, and um, he was partly unable to garden because he's elderly, but he was also unable to garden because his garden was overrun with a, a weed called Japanese knotweed. Now, I don't know much about gardening, but I know that if you have this thing in your garden, it devalues our house by up to 30%. It's virtually impossible to get rid of. And his garden was like land of the Triffids. It was just some mass of green. And the council used to come around from time to time and they would mow it down or they would burn it down. But guaranteed within three or four weeks it would all be back again. It was like a bowling green, but just set five foot off the ground. It was a perfect mass of greenness. And the annoying thing about Japanese knotweed is incredibly powerful. So it would start breaking through on our side of the fence. It would come up through the concrete patio, come up through the flagstones. It would come up anywhere, no matter how you chopped it down, burned it down, stamped on it, snipped it with your scissors, it would reappear time and time again. It was just like worry, really. No matter how you stamped it down, burnt it down, broke it down, trampled it down, somehow, a couple of weeks later, it popped back around the corner and you found yourself worrying about the same old things. The thing is, whilst it all looked the same, whilst it was all green and planty, something lay underground, three metres deep. There was a root to this particular plant, not that we ever found it. And if you could drag that root out into the light, if you could cut that root down, if you could burn that root, it would have an impact on all of the other shoots of that plant. And 1 John 4.18 is not a judgment against the fearful, but neither is it permission for us to resign ourselves to the status quo of worry because the fear of the judgment of God is a big fear. It is a root fear. You know, if your life is overwhelmed by the knotweed of worry, don't see it as all being the same because this one root fear can have an impact on every other fear in the garden. If you're worrying about death and the judgment of God, then you need to have confidence tonight because the perfect love of God made, to you known, made known to you in the person of Jesus Christ is resolved, has resolved and will resolve this fear for you. So having had this root pulled out of our lives, we see significant change in other areas. In 2 Timothy 1.7 it says, for God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. And there is power in the knowledge of the love of God for you tonight. That's what John knew you could receive. And that's why he wanted the church to stop tying its shoelaces and start running the race set before him. The idea behind Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs was proposed in 1943. And the idea there is that we have a, a, you know, a, a cake of needs. Every level provides a new uh, complexity of need which we're seeking to meet. And the principle here is that you can't develop the finer skills up the hierarchy like self-esteem until you have the basic needs sorted. And you see at the very bottom there, your physiological needs, then your safety needs, then your belonging and love needs. To, to make this simple, basically, you can't worry about your social performance when someone is chasing you with a large knife. You know, the deal is that you've got to get the big ticket issues in place first before you deal with the smaller issues. And 1 John 4.18 is like dealing right now with the big ticket issues. Actually, 1 John 4.18 is saying that there's no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because God, through the person of Jesus Christ, has dealt with our safety needs. We are secure in Christ, whether we live or die in this life. And actually we belong to him. His love for us is absolutely assured. Nothing can separate for you from the love of God made known to you in Jesus Christ. And whilst your safety needs and your belongingness and love needs are met in Christ, that enables you to see changes in the other tendrils of not, me, not weed worry in the rest of your life that actually when we've dealt with this big ticket issue, with this root issue of worry about the future, when we know security in Christ, it enables us then to address broader worries in our life. R.C. Sproul wrote, we are secure not because we hold tightly to Jesus, but because he holds tightly to us. It's the knowledge that John wants us to recognize in order that we aren't lost in the fog of fear anymore, but can actually begin to live those confident lives in the kingdom. Romans 5 one says that we're justified by faith. It's a simple step. And tonight, maybe there's some people here in the room who still are afraid of death. They're not afraid of death because they're afraid of the, of, of the pain of death. They're afraid of death because they're fearing the judgment of God. And I just want to say to you, 
If you make a decision tonight, you don't want to be afraid of death anymore, then we're invited to make peace with, Je with Jesus, with peace with God through Jesus Christ. Just to say, Jesus, I recognize that you died for me, that you love me, that you've come to take my sin upon yourself and I want to welcome you into my life today. That's a simple prayer, but that's the prayer that gives you the perfect love of God. If you've prayed that prayer before, then you need to know tonight that the perfect love of God dwells in you and that you're secure, that you don't need to fear the judgment of God anymore. You know, it's easy to preach this sermon, but it's much harder to do. I struggle with the practice of dealing with worries every day. And uh, it's particularly hard, I know, in the middle of the night when you wake up and you, know, you hear a creak downstairs and you get your golf club from under your bed, or is that just me? Uh, you know, I know I'm vulnerable, like at different times. Sometimes I feel full of faith and really confident, but sometimes I just feel fearful and I can't quite understand why. But that's why addressing fears on their own is insufficient as a response in the worry process. You know, worry makes you feel like you're doing something that's helpful and useful. Actually, it's something that's generally quite detrimental. Winston Churchill said that you'll never reach your destination if you stop to throw stones at every dog that barks. Now, he wasn't advocating throwing stones at dogs, but proverbially he's saying, you know, if we, if we focus so much on trying to stop the thing that's causing us a problem, we'll never get to the place that we need to get to. And if you're busy in your life constantly trying to stop worries, trying to deal with worries, you'll never get to the destination of where you're trying to get to. John was concerned for the church that they'd be so consumed by their own salvation and their lack of assurance of it, that they'd never go out there and start sharing the good news of the love of God with the world around them. It's the church tying its shoelaces rather than running the race set before it. John wanted the church to be assured of their salvation, confident in their salvation, no longer needing to worry about their salvation so they could actually run the race that was set before them. And tonight, you know, we need to make that journey to stop being consumed by worries and actually to stop taking steps of faith. That's why just focusing on uh, decreasing the darkness is not as effective as increasing the light. We had some family time at my parents-in-law's uh, just a, a couple of months back with one of my best friends, Tim. We've been friends for over 30 years. And uh, we've now got three kids each. And we, wives away, so, you know, we're all like, hey, kids, who's going to behave really well? They're like shaking their heads furiously. We're like, hey, kids, who's going to behave really well for loads of sweets? They're like... So immediately like, yes, this is it. Come on, guys. So we like walk down to the village shop. We were ready to seriously spend, me and my friend. We're like thinking this is a 20-quid trip. No worries. We'll be watching the football all afternoon. Uh, we went past a um, telephone booth. You know, do people remember telephone booths here? Just being sure I never know, you know. Uh, how, but I mean, obviously, telephone booths are kind of, they're obsolete now, right? Because yeah, everyone has a mobile phone. So hardly anyone actually uses a telephone booth, especially out in the countryside. And... Um, so we're walking through the village and there's a telephone booth. In my parents-in-law's village, they've turned the telephone booth into a like, kind of swapping library. So there's no telephone in there anymore. It's just full of books. And, and at the bottom, there's a section for children. And the rest is just general interest kind of books, novels and stuff. So all our kids like rushed into this telephone booth and uh, they're like looking around at the bottom for like the new titles and whatever. And they found loads of books that they really liked. They said, like, Dad, Dad, can we take these books? Can we take these books? And I was like, no, you know what? You can't because it says here that you have to put something back if you're going to take something. I said, we haven't got anything to give. So they're all very disappointed and we bribed them with sweets. But when I got back to my mother-in-law's, I found that she had a box of Christian books that she was giving away. So this is brilliant. So me and my friend, we chose the 12 most evangelistic titles we could find in this box. We had like the shack in there. We had like searching issues, Nicky Gumbel. We had like a few questions of life. You know, with some like David Watson biography. We had some really good stuff, you know, really meaty Christian evangelistic resource. The next day we took the kids down to this uh, swapping library. And um, so we carefully put these Christian books at the eye line shelves, you know, the ones that they sell in Waterstones, like the real sales shelves. We like really like place them like, you know, three or four books apart so it looked really subtle, or like the shack and everything. It's all there for someone. And there was a few dodgy books in there, so we like took them out and we turned them round. It's bad, isn't it? And then with the kids, obviously, they took their, 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 uh, their books and then we, you know, we went away and we're, still, we're praying that those 12 books will have a great impact on that village. The thing is, you know, the main thing I wanted to point out by that is that, you know, when you take something out, you've got to put something back. 
1 John 4.18 takes out the fear of judgment. It takes away the fear of judgment that was burdening us. But actually, what John 4, 1, 1 John 4.17 does, it puts in the perfect love of God. And 1 John 4.17 says, this is how love is made complete in us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. God has taken something away from us, the fear of judgment. God has placed something into us, the perfect love. And 1 John 4, 17 can be split into three clauses. Firstly, that love is made complete in us. That's the truth if you've received Jesus. Love is made complete in you. In this world, we are like him. That's the second clause. You are like Jesus. Christian actually means little Christs. You are a little Christ. You might not feel like a little Christ, but you are a little Christ if you've received Jesus. That's how God sees you. He sees you as his son. He took your shame so you might become his righteousness. And then thirdly, we will have confidence. So three things, love is made complete in us. In this world, we are like him and we will have confidence. Now, human beings are creatures of extreme habit. If you want to lose weight, going on a diet you know, is one way of doing it. A diet that just says don't eat any food from here on in and you'll get thinner is not a helpful diet because actually you'll find sooner or later that you decide you want to start eating food again. That habit of eating often keeps eating alive. The best thing to do if you're eating bad things and you want to lose weight is actually start eating new good things and you'll lose weight by doing the same habit of eating but in a slightly different way. The same is true with worry. We worry because we experience worry things that make us worry, but also because we, we are in the habit of worrying. It becomes a, a habit that overwhelms us. In his book, The Power of Habit, Charles Duhigg divides habit into a process of three steps, the reminder, the routine, and the reward. So if we're going to do worry, it would be the reminder that I'm under threat, the routine, that's when I start ruminating about something over and over again to try and work out that threat, and then the reward, which might be two or three paltry minutes of peace and quiet before the next worry comes in. So worry becomes a cycle of reminder, routine, and reward. But we can exchange that cycle for something new from 1 John 4, 17. John offers this opportunity to change our minds, but also to change the world. He offers us a new reminder. This is that love is made complete among us. That's the reminder that love is made complete amongst you. That's what God's done on the cross. The routine is that in this world, we are like Jesus. So this is a call to outwork the truth that love is made complete amongst us. And the reward is that we will have confidence. When we exchange the worry cycle for this new cycle of love and trust, our experience gets better. So we in a moment of anguish, we'll say, ah, love is made complete in us. This is good. Like God knows me. God is for me. God has done a work for me. In this world, I'm going to outwork that by doing acts of service and faith prepared in advance for me to do, which will make me like Jesus. That's how God sees me. And my reward is I feel confident because I know I'm in his hands. And I want to encourage you Write it down, take a picture of it on your phone. Remind a routine reward to set, to make new habits of being. Not to be overwhelmed anymore by fear, by problem worry, but actually to choose to exchange the cycle of worry for a new cycle, a cycle of faith. It's not easy, I've got to be honest. I've been practicing for 20 more and more years. But it's something that can change the power. But nothing can change the power more than knowing than having the confidence that God has overcome judgment and death and sin in our lives. So 1 John 4, 17 and 1 John 4, 18 are about changing our minds and changing our hearts. Firstly, to show us that we don't need to fear judgment anymore because it's resolved in Christ. And secondly, to have confidence because Christ dwells within us. Now, these two in and out parts of this really important letter were aimed at the church becoming the confident, empowered kingdom movement that it was always called to be. And that's you. John doesn't offer us any ambiguity. There are no qualifications. If you're a fearful person, be careful because this probably doesn't apply to you. 
There is no qualifications and there's no ambiguity. There aren't any gray areas. Love is made complete in us. We are like him and we will have confidence. You know, that first sh slide I showed you, I told you that I texted God back because actually the way my phone works is to eat in the verses. So I kind of, I just put the verse in just like the text bot does. And I didn't really expect a response, but you know what? I got one. Um, this is it. Will, the funniest thing. I woke up thinking of you and Louis, that's my wife, and then your text was directed to me, praying for you today and sending much love to you and your family. Mary, P.S., come and visit sometime. We'd love to see you. Now, I didn't know God was called Mary, but there we are. It's the first thing. You know, what's really interesting about this is that actually... Barry and Mary, a lovely, godly couple who are, old, are quite old now, and um, we know them well. And they've been texting us Bible verses, as I say, for more than seven years. But I thought that they passed on the baton to someone else. So I thought it was remarkable. I mean, maybe it's a small thing, right? Maybe it's just a small, small thing. But they happened to be thinking about us that morning when I texted her when I was preparing this sermon. And it was just a simple little thing, but it just reminded me, you know, that God, he's listening to you just like you're listening to him that he wants to have a conversation with you, that he wants to give you assurance, that he wants to let you know that he's thinking about you, that he's encouraged by you, that, that he'd love you to come and see him sometime. He'd love you to spend time with him, to build relationship with him. Because he's not just a God of big ticket statements. He's God of the personal conversation. And he wants to give you assurance tonight. He wants to give you confidence tonight. And he wants to empower you to step away from powerful fears and step into powerful confidence for the sake of the kingdom of God.